So our next uh, group, our next organization, I've been talking to quite a bit, and I'm uh, extremely excited to bring them to the stage. Not only because they are uh, working throughout the world in terms of disaster relief, but as you will hear, they are uh, being much more proactive about it uh, in terms of training, in terms of the building of the communities, uh, so that regardless of where disaster hits, people will be ready and uh, uh, hopefully more people will survive and uh, things will get back to normal uh, as quickly as possible. Something they're gonna talk about today is very timely in the news, uh, refugees. And, uh, uh, and we've been reading about it every day and I'm really glad that they're here to shed some light on their work. International Medical Corps will discuss how as first responders, creating self-reliant, self-sustaining medical services and infrastructure will do more than just put a Band-Aid on a dam. So please welcome International Medical Corps. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear us? We just got mic'd up. Okay. So my name is Priya Berry. I'm Chief of Staff at TOMS, and um, we are going to be focusing the conversation on refugees. Um, it's quite a serious issue, but my colleagues have promised me to keep this entertaining and fun, and in fact, before we were coming up here, they were threatening to do that conversation in Russian. So um, I think if I get boring, they're going to help spice it up. But um, Look, I'm pretty ill-equipped for this task. I've never really worked in refugee communities um, or served them directly, but luckily uh, my colleagues have. Um, our two esteemed panelists here today um, have, um, have not only educated themselves, but have also um, have firsthand experience in serving refugee communities. I'd like to introduce Chris Skopek, Senior Director of Emergency Response from International Medical Corps, one of our um, giving partners at TOMS um, as well, which we're very proud of. Chris has spent uh, years serving co uh, refugee communities around the world, um, most recently in Jordan, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then we also have the amazing uh, Anne V, uh, model and actress from Russia, and also a dear friend of TOMS who's lent her name and her voice to help influence and rally a broader response um, to refugees and, and serve as a first responder. She'll tell you more about what that means um, for, for International Medical Corps. Um, so look, I mean, refugees is, is no silent topic in the news today, but the reality is as much of the world has turned a blind eye on the issue until um, many people were woken up to seeing the photo of, um, of young Elan on the beach, and, and that's what turned us on, but um, that leaves us with 60 million refugees today which is a stark and staggering number, um, and one that is, is quite overwhelming. Uh, the number continues to grow, with more than half of those being children, which is even more staggering. I'm gonna turn to Chris, actually, to just kick off the conversation, and really just, Chris, can you shed some more light on the global refugee yeah, crisis? Yeah, certainly, Priya. Where we are today? And, and thank you, I mean, I think the number uh, can't be understated, 60 million, that's more refugees today than we've had since uh, World War II. Uh, and, uh, it's not getting easier to deal with. What I, what I think most people don't recognize is that uh, the status as a refugee is not a short-term uh, condition. In fact, uh, today, the average life uh, or duration of displacement for a refugee is 17 years. Uh, in fact, uh, my, my wife fled uh, her country and her homeland uh, in 1992 and hasn't been able to return since. Uh, so the idea that we're dealing with short-term problems uh, that we need to put a Band-Aid on is, is really a misconception. We, we have to find durable and sustainable solutions uh, because the problem is not going away. Uh, the, the causes uh, that, that uh, are creating this refugee uh, situation is, is only getting worse. These are natural disasters, they're man-made disasters. We've had more large-scale emergencies in the past decade than we've had at any time in the last 50 years. Uh, and by all signs, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Uh, but one of the other things that we're coming to recognize is that the concept of a refugee camp uh, is, it can be a bit misleading. Uh, only 20% of refugees around the world live in camps. The rest of them are living in urban environments. 
Um, so all of our procedures, all of our mechanisms for addressing refugees had historically been developed around that camp setting. Um, basic uh, measures, understanding that uh, each refugee needs 15 liters of water per person per day and, uh, and very basic standards of, of living and care. Uh, but at the urban, within an urban community, it's really hard to measure and define, even to identify where they are. It's, it's, and it's easy for people to fall through the gaps. Uh, uh, children who are unaccompanied uh, minors um, and understanding their needs. Now, what is a refugee? A refugee is a person who has fled their homeland uh, due to fear, persecution, uh, threat of, of death, uh, and has crossed a border, an international border, and they're protected under international humanitarian law which, and, and international human rights, uh, which says that every person uh, has the right to seek refuge in a foreign country, has the right to basic services, has the right to education, has a right to legal protection, which in theory sounds great, but when you start seeing the pressures that are put on these countries, when you see the massive numbers, in practice it becomes very difficult. Uh, and when you look at uh, the, the sheer magnitude of refugees that are living in urban environments amidst host communities, then the issue doesn't just become about how do we address the needs of the refugee, but what about the host communities? when suddenly they're not just in your area and creating security risks, which many of us are very familiar with, but you're also competing for jobs. You're watching the cost of living go up. Go up. You're seeing that your children are now in schools that are overflowing and you can't access health care. And so it has a huge impact when one out of every four people in Lebanon today is a refugee. And these are refugees that four years ago were not there. So trying to understand the context only in, in, uh, it, with it, it, an eye on the refugee, but overlooking the broader issue that it has on the communities in which they're working, and, and really the people that have opened their homes and their lives to, and have done more than all of us combined to, to really meet their basic needs, uh, is, is something that we have to uh, really focus our attention on. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, I was um, just, um, reading a recent op-ed by Jeff Sachs, and he very effectively brought up um, the point, the two sides of the coin in the refugee scenario, and I have to admit, I, I didn't really understand um, true, the true impact on the host community, mm. so thanks for bringing up that point. Um, but what I find even more, um, I guess, harder to grasp, I don't know if you all were shocked by, by Chris's statement that you know, refugees, the length of, of time is, is really, the, of displacement, 17 years, so that's almost two decades. Right. Uh, for me, what that tells me is that if we don't come up with an adequate response, we have a lost generation, right? 20 years, so um, I find that, that frightening um, and knowing that there are many that are already in that situation. I think we should go a little bit deeper. Um, Anvi before the session also helped me realize the impact um, that's disproportionately affecting women and children. I wonder, and if you can, you know, as a mother, as a first responder for International Medical Corps, can you reflect on that a little bit and, and, and share your, um, your first-hand experiences as well? Mm -hmm. uh, hi, everyone. Um, I feel really fortunate to be here and talk about this topic. Um, I'm originally from Russia, and um, you know, I would never understand what refugees go through, but I left Russia when I was 15 years old. Um, I was out speaking English, was out my family. I came to the U.S. for um, for the hope of a better future. Um, my dream was to become a model, and I became one, and um, I had an amazing opportunity to travel around the world and uh, see different nationalities, like, be exposed to different cultures, and you know, I became a really big uh, women's advocate because um, in Russia, women don't really have an opportunity to use their voice, um, and, and I didn't really feel like I could use my voice and I could really achieve what I wanted to achieve, and I had an amazing opportunity of coming to America and realizing my dream. Um, and when I was doing uh, research, I, I found that 80% um, um, of refugees are women and children, and 75% of all Syrian refugees are women, and 70% of all Hungary are women, and you know, it's such a heartbreaking situation, what's happening in the world, that uh, we really need to target women to really help the situation. And you know, we, we've really seen so much in the news, uh, this amazing, incredible stories with 200 people trying to flee their country, um, 
you know, 200 people on one boat trying to go to Europe and cross Mediterranean and uh, putting their families at risk. And as a new mother, I mean, I can't really, I can't imagine what courage it takes to risk the life of their families, their children, uh, their lives to hope, just hope to get a better future somewhere. And um, yeah. Yeah, it's the, um it is hard to get even inside to even try and grasp what that feeling would be um, as a mother myself to un even understand what, how bad it would have to be to compel you to take on that likely tragic journey. Um, but thank you for pointing to what's happening today in the recent situation. Um, Let's take, a, let's take a view into Syria. I wonder mm. if Chris, maybe you can help us sure, sure. understand what's really going on. I mean, it's the, you know, the largest humanitarian crisis we're facing of the day. Um, it's on our screens every day, uh, but yet um, it continues. Right, right. It's a country of 22 million. Four million have already fled the country. Eight million more are displaced within the country. We're going into the fifth year, and there's no uh, solution in sight. Now, we've seen the, the impact of the refugee flow into Europe on an almost daily basis ever since uh, the images of the young boy washing up on shore in Greece uh, brought it to our attention. But the fact is, this has been four years in the making. Uh, Lebanon and Turkey are both hosting over a million refugees. Jordan is hosting 700,000. This is a country of, of less than 5 million people. And, and so it's just a matter of time before uh, we've reached a, a breaking point and where the overflow is going to happen. And, and as you heard yesterday from a firsthand experience of a refugee, they're fleeing uh, some, it, it, leaving your home is an act of extreme desperation. And as soon as you leave your home, and this is a study done by UNHCR, the level of vulnerability that you face and your family faces goes up uh, exponentially. You're not doing it because you're looking for a better life. You're doing it because you were, it's your only option left to you. And so no amount of controls at the border or any other regulations are going to stop people from, from doing that and trying to flee to safety. Now, interestingly, the European Union has been one of uh, the most vocal advocates for refugee rights around the world. They never stop beating the, go the governments of Kenya, Iran, Jordan over the heads with this important idea that this is your responsibility. You are, you are responsible for serving this population and protecting their rights. But once it's in their borders, suddenly it becomes a very different dialogue. Now it's their national security issue. Now it's their economic concern. Uh, now there's public opinion weighing in on it. And we find ourselves talking about things like refugees crossing illegally into Greece. But we've never talked about a Somali family illegally crossing into Kenya to flee famine or flee al-Shabaab. So the dialogue has changed very much. Um, so whereas international humanitarian law is that on paper, theoretically, it's wonderful. But the practical application of it uh, becomes very difficult when we start seeing these numbers. Uh, and so it's all the more reason why we have to stay um, very vocal for their rights. We have to take an apolitical approach to it. We cannot get caught up uh, in that. Otherwise, we will look biased, and it'll affect our ability to, to serve. Um, and uh, just one more point to that uh, is, forgive me, I've just slipped my thought. Um, anyways, I'll, okay. I'll come back to it if, no if you don't mind. I had a follow-on question yeah. for you, actually, so maybe this will get to okay. it. Um, you were actually in Jordan when right. the war in Syria was breaking out. Right. Did you have any um, idea that it was going to get this to the scale and, and go on? We, we thought there was potential, but nobody thought it could come to this scale. I mean, quite simply, it's, it's been five years on. Uh, we, we saw prior to Syria, we saw what happened in Egypt. We saw what happened in Tunisia. We saw what happened in Libya. We imagined it would go a similar path, uh, mm. and it didn't. But we have to be prepared, and we've got to be there uh, to serve and respond. Mm, yeah, good point. I, what I've learned from Chris is just, and, and from the news and, and everything that, that, that we've been digesting on social media is just how incredibly complex the scenario is. It's massive, but it's also complex. And with that, you know, in order for an organization like International Medical Corps to be equipped to respond, partnerships are essential. Um, Tom's uh, has had the privilege of working with International Medical Corps for a number of years now. Uh, in fact, they, along with our other giving partners, have 
really helped us give 45 million pairs of shoes to kids in need to date. But we actually only recently started giving to refugees in 2011. Um, International Medical Corps and other giving partners are the ones that helped us see that opportunity and helped us understand how we could effectively serve uh, refugee communities. So we're now giving um, with International Medical Corps to refugees in Jordan and DRC and Ethiopia, uh, along with um, nine other countries with some of our other giving partners, which is an incredible honor. Um, but yet we know that those shoes um, are part of health, education, nutrition programs. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny drop in the bucket. It's almost so tiny that we feel uncomfortable talking about it. And um, I'd love to, to hear um, from you, Chris, in terms of are you seeing you know, sufficient mobilization from the private sector? Do you, and, and, and from what you've seen, what are you most excited about? You guys have some great success stories with Facebook and, yeah. and other no, I think I think the private sector has had an incredible impact. Uh, you know, we've, we've become much more sophisticated in our ability to monitor events and to have early warning when we are seeing humanitarian crises in the making. But early warning does not always result in early action. Um, and, and sadly, it, you know, we can see we, a famine coming in the Horn of Africa four, five, six months in advance. But until the images of starving children hit our TV screens and hit the newspapers, the resources to mobilize aren't coming. Uh, in Europe, I talked about the politics of, of the refugee situation. Our very first dollar coming from the European Union to support the refugees in Europe is hopefully coming next week. Meanwhile, we've spent the last three months working with funding from private corporations and private individuals who know that this is not a new crisis. This is a developing crisis. And we have to start using our early warning systems to result in early action. And that's bridging that gap between the institutional donor funding um, and the start of a crisis or at the point where we need to be intervening is where the private sector has really had a huge impact. Mm. All right, thank you. And Anne, you've done a brilliant job yourself, even just educating yourself and finding your passion how did you mm -hmm. come to that? Well, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of problems in the world, and I think we all can help. And I think educating yourself and really finding what you're passionate about is a really big key, you know, whether it's International Medical Corps or there's another organization, I think we can all help because, you know, we have a lot of problems in the world, unfortunately. Um, you know, with International Medical Corps, uh, you can become a first responder, and you can, um, you know, you can be on a field and not on a field, and you can really, speak on behalf of people who don't have a voice or who don't have an opportunity to, to be here. Um, and it's been really exciting because social media has become such a huge platform, not only for me, but for everyone to really, um, to really help. You know, one of the examples that I can give, we created this amazing campaign called The Bump Day, and we ask women um, to share pictures of themselves being pregnant uh, to raise awareness for maternal health and healthy pregnancies around the world. And uh, 40 million people participated in that campaign. And it's so amazing because it's 40 more, pe pe 40 more million people that um, are aware of problems of maternal health and, um, around the world. So, Social media, I would say, you know, really take advantage of that because it's been such an amazing platform to really spread awareness about cause that you really care about. And, uh, you know, I would just say we all have a voice. There's so many people in the world who don't. So really use it and um, really use it. It's a really powerful tool. It has a huge impact for us. I mean, we need, it's not, just, it's not just raising money. Raising money helps, it's very important, it's critical for a response, but it's that advocacy, it's pushing back. I mean, we can only advocate so much uh, to the host governments, we can only advocate so much to our own governments around policy, they get tired of hearing our voice. But, but you guys have a very powerful voice and, uh, and one that's gonna speak to them from a different angle and realize that it's in all of our collective interests uh, to address these problems. So having people like uh, Anne step up and, and raise awareness and, and yourselves, just it, it's tremendous the impact that it has on the kind of work that we're trying to do. Mm. It's a great point I think that both of you have made, especially because a crisis of the size can be daunting and people can almost be paralyzed, right? And not quite knowing what they should do or what they can do or feeling like maybe they don't have a role. 
Um, but there's, um, there's plenty that you can do from watching Anne as, as a role model. Um, and, and, he, and IMC has done an incredible job through their campaigns to create easy ways for people to get involved. So we just want to encourage all of you, whether it's International Medical Corps or other organizations, to really realize that you do have a role. Um, there's a, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a very human aspect to the crisis, and it's up to us to keep it human um, and, and to direct, take direct action. Um, without that, uh, we simply won't be able to, to solve the problem, no matter, what, um, no matter what company or what government or community you represent. But um, this really is about a global humanity. And I would just close, um, since we're out of time, by saying if, if you yourself um, were trying to flee danger or were forced to flee danger because it was that bad and simply trying to find a secure place for your family, how would you want to be received and what resources would you want to have in place on the other end to know that you might have the chance of, um, of a future? I thought you were going to end with a joke because we need to keep it light. Yeah, we need to keep it light. So who's got a joke? Are we going to hear it in Russian? I left all my Russian jokes at home. Or my re <laughs> Sorry, I got lots of Russian jokes, not as many refugee jokes. <laughs> Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.